Good day, everyone. Welcome. Happy Friday. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. It is my honor and privilege today to welcome our speaker, Dr. Angela Laird from Florida International University in Miami, Florida. Dr. Laird received her Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Florida State University in 1998 and her PhD in physics and medical physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2002. As mentioned, Dr. Laird was originally trained as an imaging physicist but has transformed herself into a cognitive neuroscience aiming to characterize the functional organization of the human brain. She was a faculty member at the Research Imaging Institute of the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio from 2004 to 2012, and is currently an associate professor, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Angie. Full professor. <laughs> Full professor, she, she, congratulations, <laughs> uh, in the Department of Physics at uh, FIU. Uh, she's been recognized as a rising star at the University of Texas and is a top scholar um, at Florida International University in 2013. And Dr. Laird and her laboratory uh, developed novel data analytic algorithms, um, neuroimaging informatics tools, and neuroimaging ontologies to yield analytic strategies for improving investigations into functional brain networks of healthy individuals, as well as populations with psychiatric and neurological diseases and disorders. Her research is currently funded by several awards from the National Institutes of Health and from the National Science Foundation. Dr. Laird's presentation today is entitled Progress Towards Large-Scale Consensus-Based Models of Human Brain Function, Contributions from FMR. And as always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2020-2021 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Laird via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and I will ask them on your behalf in the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, welcome, Angie. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Jack, for the very kind invitation. Thanks so much um, for that introduction. I really appreciate being here and, and spending a little bit of time with everybody. Um, so just to get started, uh, as, as you mentioned, I am an, an imaging physicist. So, so this talk is sort of going to, to center around functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, I started grad school back at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, this was back in the late 90s, which was the early golden age of functional MR research. Uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee was among the first groups in 1991 to demonstrate the ability to image human brain activation using fMRI with uh, blood oxygenation dependent contrast. And, and those years, um, that was an exciting time to be a physicist in Wisconsin. So when I was a grad student in Madison, we were riding the wave of those early successes from folks like Jim Hyde and Eric Long and Peter Bandettini and just starting to learn um, not just about task-based activations, but also vessel state connectivity. And there's a lovely little citation down at the bottom, uh, a paper that Peter Bamatini wrote that kind of talks about this time. So if, if there are any physicists and engineers in the audience um, who haven't had a chance to kind of um, take a look at that and, and hear about uh, that particular error, I, I highly recommend that you do so that it was, uh, it was, it was a cool time to be a physicist in, in Wisconsin. So with that as an introduction in, into who I am and, and my particular training, um, today what I want to talk about is that here in 2021, I cannot believe it's 2021, I'm not sure what happened in 2020, but there you go, um, our broader scientific community is rightfully focused on the current reproducibility crisis. And there's a lot of development for amazing and innovative tools and resources and best practices to ensure that ongoing work in, in neuroimaging in general and fMRI specifically is robust, reproducible, and reliable, those three Rs, right? But looking back 30 years ago, even during that time when fMRI was being developed as an imaging modality, a few groups were early pioneers in looking at consensus across studies and comparing activations observed across multiple studies to determine where there was agreement. And when there was an agreement, such as in the case of the anterior cingulate cortex, 
they examine experimental design across those studies. Um, and these two papers here being examples of proto meta analytic studies uh, that focus on somatotopic mapping of the anterior cingulate cortex. And in the first paper that I'm aware of that was published in 1993 by Tomas Powell and colleagues, in that paper, they examined various uh, functional pet experiments that required hand responses, speech and eye movements, and map the variability of responses across the cingulate. And this was followed by a similar effort in 1996. So my point here is really to emphasize that we are really embedded in this reproducibility crisis. But you know, if you really look back, you can see that we have been interested in reproducibility framed as consensus across studies um, for, for quite a long while now. And so um, we know, we've known pretty much from the very beginning that there are limitations to any single neuroimaging study. Um, such as small samples, right? Um, compared to other fields of in cognitive and social science, and particularly clinical research, neuroimaging work, fMRI studies, um, you know, really rely on the publishing of, of relatively small samples, which obviously can have um, uh, are a significant limitation and, and, and don't allow uh, generalization. Another limitation is that fMRI in particular is an indirect measure of neuronal activity. And by focusing on the cold contrast, then, then you know, we do need to acknowledge that our reliability is limited by the biological, technical, and methodological compounds associated with that contrast. Another thing um, that there's a lot of attention that's, that's being drawn to recently is, is the publication of isolated findings. You know, we are all in a, in a scientific culture that it emphasizes innovativeness and emphasizes being the first one to do things. And so because of the logistics and expense of fMRI, additional experiments where you're just confirming something that someone has already published and, and maybe extending it just a little bit, um, you know, there's not so much an emphasis on that. I, I think there's a little bit of a culture shift that's happening right now um, but looking back over the past few decades, we really have a whole lot of literature that's all about isolated findings and, and not so much about confirming and replicating across studies. Related to that is the, the real generalization that we do of context-specific findings. And, and here, what we're saying is that we make a lot of inferences about brain function and some sort of path mechanism that's based on a specific observed difference between two imaging conditions. Um, and, you know, given the way that our, our, our field is sort of framed, um, this really is kind of a stretch sometimes. So um, because of all of these things, we know that any single study may have some uh, limitations associated with that. But um, because of that, there is an opportunity to pursue meta-analysis to look at a consensus across studies. So um, all of this is, is kind of a, a lengthy lead up to say that today we're going to be talking about neuroimaging meta-analysis, where we examine consensus across studies by mining data uh, activation patterns that are reported in the literature. And one of the reasons why this is something that has really taken off in fMRI is because fMRI research generally adheres to two community-based standards. We spatially normalize our brains to a standard brain template, and when we report results of any given statistical parametric brain image, um, such as what you see here, uh, for each cluster or blob of activation, we extract the centers of mass or the peak locations and report those locations in standard brain space as an XYZ location. And so as a result, a given peer reviewed paper is gonna publish the picture of the fMRI activation patterns that you see here on the right and the res uh, as the result of some particular task, along with an accompanying table on the left of what we call peak coordinates, which summarize those patterns and give you a quantitative representation of the brain maps produced by the study. And so our literature is chock full of these map table pairings. Um, there's a lot of them. You, you, if you spend any amount of time in the literature, you know that uh, these tables are, are very much a community standard and they're available in the PDFs of all the different papers that we read. And so from our early days, we've really been considering how these coordinates can be plotted on the same map across study, uh, representing results observed across many studies. 
And so this was the initial impetus that led us to the development of algorithms and data analysis strategies for formal, quantitative, and coordinate-based meta-analysis. So one of the key things to consider is that when I say meta-analysis, um, I don't mean that standard effect size meta-analysis in which results are pooled to determine this, if a statistically significant finding is observed across studies. Um, this type of meta-analysis has, in, in some respects, a sort of complex history. And in some cases, some sort of questionable practices that lead to, in some cases, essentially key hacking a positive outcome. Um, you know, I, uh, you, you can spend a little bit of time with the clinical trials literature reading about effect size meta-analysis, and, and that's an interesting sort of uh, well to dive into. Um, but for today, I want to emphasize that what I'm presenting is a locations effects meta-analysis, which instead of asking, is there a significant effect across these studies, we ask of the significant effects reported across the whole brain, where do they converge? So it's that location emphasis here. Um, in the coordinate basement analysis, we ask where is the consensus? So there's a number of different coordinate based uh, meta analysis methods that are available to research, but they all follow the same general procedure. Let's walk through that and, and then give you an illustration of it. Um, if the first step is to convolve the foci with spatial kernel to produce study specific model deprivation maps. We combine those model activation maps into a sample wise map and then compare um, to the null distribution to determine voxel wise statistical significance. So an example is activation likelihood estimation. I'm going to give you that as a coordinate based meta analysis method. It's a very popular choice. Um, so for illustrative purposes, let's let's kind of see what it what it actually does. The general approach here is that each foci or set of coordinates is modeled by a 3D Gaussian distribution. Um, we do uh, the convolution to kind of you know essentially blur those coordinates back to the to the uh, uh, spatial blobs that they were extracted from. So for any particular set of coordinates that you observe across the literature. We can do the convolution process, combine those model activation maps into a sample-wide map, and then threshold them based on statistical significance. Um, so the idea is generally to just to take the coordinates, blur them all, do some stats, and then have a summary map that represents consensus across studies. Okay, so beyond AL, there are several other coordinate-based meta-analysis approaches that are available to neuroimaging researchers. And these were nicely summarized in a 2017 publication. Um, and so if, if you are interested in coordinate basement analysis, these are sort of your choices at this point. But then the second major category, um, the second major category of neuroimaging meta-analysis is an image-based approach. And so in this case, rather than pool coordinates or peak foci, IBMAs pull the statistical maps, the actual result of whatever um, statistical analysis that was done on, on your fMRI data. Um, these have better spatial specificity than peak coordinates, obviously. And so by combining these maps, we ask where do the images converge? So uh, various different image-based meta-analysis methods were nicely summarized in a 2016 publication. Um, and then I'll also note here that while image-based meta-analysis is preferred, given the additional information that maps offer us with, compared to tables of coordinates, image-based meta-analyses are relatively rare. There's only a handful of them out there in the literature. And this is because a hardworking researcher can dig through hundreds of papers, harvest coordinates from the tables, do a coordinate-based meta-analysis, but they can't just sort of magically gain access to original statistical maps those need to be made available by the original authors. And that's why at this point um, in the presentation, I like to say, hey, folks, when you're drafting your manuscripts, please go ahead and upload your maps to NeuroVault. These are you know, whatever group activation image you have or correlation analysis or resting C-based productivity analysis, anything that results in a brain map, upload it to NeuroVault, cite it in your paper. And that helps with folks who are interested in your paper being able to go look and actually see your maps. But also downstream, image-based meta-analysis doesn't really have a future unless all of us adopt this little bit of data sharing into our publication pipelines. 
All right. And then so as a little bit of a plug, I will say the previous slide listed a whole bunch of different coordinate based meta analysis methods and image based meta analysis methods. And prior to a couple of years ago, those were all located in different, um, different sources, different code, different uh, platforms and in, 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 in locations. And in, I want to say, let's see, this is this is a graduate student of mine named Taylor Salo. He has developed Nymare, which is short for Neural Imaging Meta Analysis Research Environment. It is a Python package that integrates all of these different algorithms and methods for neural imaging meta analysis and places everything in a common interface. Um, it's Python based. It's open source. Um, we're very collaborative that if you're interested in contributing to this package and joining um, this particular e ecosystem that ties in with NyPipe, NyStats, and NyLearn, then, then we, we welcome everyone's contributions. If you just want to use meta-analysis, then, then this is the place that we now recommend that you go since it is tightly integrated with all of these other different resources. So um, hats off to Taylor for the initial work that he's done developing Nightmare because it's really been a, a nice step forward for the community. Okay, so that's all sort of an introduction to, um, you know, the, the topic of, of this talk, which is which is meta analyses, um, and I I want to move now to give you some examples of what meta analysis possibly can do for you, and you know with this particular start of this slide, I I could just tell you that meta analyses have gotten hugely popular. Um, you've probably seen that yourself in the literature. I you know I tried to prepare a couple of plots here that illustrate that point. Ale is one of our more popular algorithms. Um, and then Neurosynth is a, a coordinate-based database that's designed to facilitate coordinate-based meta-analysis. Um, or you can do a lit search or just by looking for keywords of fMRI plus meta-analysis. And you can see that you know we're, we're working on increasing the number of papers out there on these particular topics. Um, but what I think is more important is to give you an example of you know, how this can be used and what sort of knowledge might be gained from neuroimaging meta-analysis. So the first example is a JAMA psychiatry paper from 2015. In this meta-analysis, the authors performed a coordinate-based meta-analysis of voxel-based morphometry or VBM studies that examined gray matter reductions across six diverse diagnostic groups that included schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, addiction, obsessive compulsive disorder, and anxiety. So this was a really large VBM meta-analysis that included uh, 193 peer-reviewed papers, um, representing a total of over 7,000 patients and over 8,000 matched healthy controls. Now, despite such a diverse diagnostic group, they found that gray matter loss converged in three regions, the dorsal anterior cingulate and the bilateral insula. Um, I'll also note that when they examined diagnos uh, diagnosis-specific effects, they found hardly any with the expect, uh, exception of some distinction between schizophrenia and depression and the other diagnoses. And to help interpret and give functional context to these findings, they then explore the task-based and task-free connectivity of these regions um, with a parallel series of data mining activities. First, they examine meta-analytic co-activation patterns using BrainMap, which is another coordinate-based database, and uh, this identified regions that consistently co-activated with each of the common gray matter loss regions in healthy participants during task-based activation studies in, in which we were not limited to any specific task domain. And then second, in an independent but parallel analysis, they investigated seed-based resting state connectivity patterns in an existing data set of 100 healthy participants for each of the three regions of interest um, that are shown in, in the blue here. Um, and then finally, they summarize these results and examine the conjunction between the task-based co-activations and the task-free resting state connectivity patterns, revealing a tightly connected common neural substrate that included the bilateral anterior insula, dorsal anterior cingulate, and the thalamus. And so we've started referring to these um, complex meta-analytic and connectivity-based pipelines as meta-connectomics since we're incorporating task and rest connect tones from non-meta-analytic data to enhance our meta-analytic outcomes. Okay, so um, 
in summary, then, this work highlights the importance of the insula and the ACC as highly connected brain regions that are linked to shared structural changes across transdiagnostic psychopathological disorders. And um, so this is a, a really well-cited paper that's a really good example of how meta-analysis can really lead to a, a, a complex series of pipelines that really further elucidate uh, functional um, connectomes. And then the second meta-analysis that I wanna highlight, it's another JAMA psychiatry paper, and this one from 2017. And whereas the last one focused on transdiagnostic structural alterations, this one examined aberrant fMRI brain activations during cognitive and emotional processing in patients with unipolar with depression. So not a whole bunch of disorders, but just one uh, particular disorder. Um, and while the first example meta-analyzed results from structural studies, BVM studies, um, we know that the fMRI literature is much more complicated. There are a lot of different tasks that researchers have used to probe depression, and each has its own experimental design and analysis methods. So here we examine coordinate-based meta-analysis or coordinate-based results from 99 experiments, reporting on over 100 depressed patients. And in this figure, we show the red coordinates for increased activations in, associated with depression, and blue as decreased activations. Um, again, associated with depression, both for emotional in the top row and cognitive, um, the bottom row task. So emotional task on the top, cognitive task on the bottom. And when we meta-analyze these coordinates, we found no convergence, not for any of the specific groups of coordinates we meta-analyze, not for the increases in activation, not for the decreases, not for the emotional task, not for the cognitive task. And I love this paper for two reasons. The first being that it's absolutely fabulous progress for our scientific community to get no results published in data psychiatry, right? Um, but also for what this paper is actually telling us. We don't attribute our null results to a lack of meta-analytic statistical power. We know from a previous paper um, that focused on meta-analytic power that our sample was large enough and we had sufficient power to detect even subtle convergence effects. And our conclusion here is that the lack of convergence across fMRI studies of unipolar depression is likely attributed to a high degree of heterogeneity across studies, particularly those that related to experimental flexibility. Um, and that's differences in experimental design and analytic procedures. And so overall, this work points to a really urgent need for a strong focus on replication analyses. Um, you know, we, we need more of those in our community, particularly with respect to clinical neuroimaging rather than continuing to really focus simply on designing um, the, the, the newer, the more complex, uh, new paradigms, um, new, new ways of doing things, but to, to really kind of take a step back and put an emphasis on replications. And this aligns with a number of current high profile efforts to really shine a light on the strong impact that methodological flexibility may be having on our neuroimaging results. Um, the most recent example of that is the, the NARC's Nature Study that came out, I guess it was last summer or last fall, um, where um, a bunch of teams were recruited to all analyze the same data set, showing that um, methodological flexibility actually has a really significant impact on the conclusions of those analyses. Okay, so those are my two examples of what the standard meta-analytic approach can possibly do. Um, I like to highlight those because they're a nice compare and contrast set of examples. And now what I'd like to do is dig a little bit of detail, or dig, dig a little bit deeper and show some more detail about how my lab is further pushing this methodology. Um, and so to kind of set this up, um, I wanna highlight the fact that we, you know, are seeing a lot of informatics development in the community. And, and that means more resources for managing, sharing, and meta-analysis of neuroimaging data. Um, and this includes knowledge representation systems. And, you know, it was mentioned in the introduction that I, I've done some work on ontologies, which are machine interpretable, interpretable languages to allow computers to compare data across databases. Um, and the cognitive data descriptors are relatively underdeveloped. So even if you get a bunch of scientists in the room um, to kind of list this, the, the subtypes of um, tasks or paradigms that are used or mental functions or constructs, 
um, you don't always get a lot of consensus across groups. This is something that it's not like you can just kind of list different imaging acquisition parameters, that, that getting folks to agree on how, um, which data descriptors we have to develop to, to annotate cognitive types of constructs is really, really challenging and has been so for forever. Um, so we put forward a, a bit of a, of a um, new approach using that analysis that asks the question, why not let the data facilitate consensus? And so the premise here is that differences in activation patterns across a group of studies should be captured and leveraged as they potentially indicate meaningful segregations in brain function. But sometimes it's the differences that are, are what tells us something really interesting, such that tasks activating similar brain networks should be grouped as functionally similar in the cognitive schema and tasks demonstrating differential activation patterns should be potentially classified as functionally distinct. So the overall workflow here is, um, like with all of these coordinate basement analysis approaches, the first step is to extract coordinates from the literature. So you get all these tables and pull down a whole bunch of coordinates and generate modeled activation maps. Um, and so this is done across a group of similar studies um, for wh whatever construct you're, you're interested in going after. Um, these model activation maps basically take the, the coordinates, blur them up, so you have a, an estimate of what the original statistical parametric looked like, a uh, statistical parametric image looked like. And then you generate a correlation matrix that compares all of these different activation maps to each other. Um, so that we have a sense of the similarity across um, modeled activation maps. And then we perform a data-driven clustering algorithm on those modeled activation maps to identify clusters of experiments with similar activation patterns. Those clusters then can be grouped um, and you can generate an AL map of those and analyze the uh, resulting metadata. Every particular study um, can be annotated with metadata that corresponds to the type of task that was um, used in the experimental design and the behavioral or cognitive domain of interest um, that was isolated by the particular contrast that generated the statistical parametric image. Um, so here, what I, I, I'll give you an example of this. We took a large group of face perception tasks that were downloaded from the BrainMap database um, I, I believe there was over 300 uh, individual uh, statistical parametric images um, that we had coordinates for, and we clustered them to obtain four different clusters. And what you see here are the AL images that take those individual clusters and meta-analyze them to come up with a consensus map of what the activation patterns look like within each of these clusters. Now, as I mentioned, every set of coordinates is annotated with metadata that tells you about the type of task, what the participants did while they were in the scanner. And you can look at that metadata to really get a sense of the trends um, of which types of tasks were used in any given cluster. And so what we found here was that in the case of the, the first cluster, the blue one here, the, the map really uh, resembled strongly the salience network, which included bilateral insulin anterior cingulate. And the meta indicated that of, of the tasks that were in this grouping, there was a lot of emphasis on visual spatial attention and visual motor coordination to faces. In terms of cluster two, um, we saw the amygdala, fusiform face area, occipital temporal areas, and the metadata corresponded to perception and recognition of faces. For the green cluster, we uh, observed that the, the map itself resemble the default mode network, including medial prefrontal cortex and pre, pre, uh, medial pre, uh, precuneus. And the metadata uh, corresponded to uh, lots of social processing and episodic recall of faces. And then finally, we had a little bit of a red cluster in the middle of temporal gyrus and the temporal cortex, temporal pole and parahippocampal gyrus. And the tasks uh, as revealed by the metadata corresponded to face naming and lexical retrieval. And so this is great. It's, you know, we did a meta-analysis, we did some clustering, we did some data-driven stuff, but it's always important when you do data-driven analyses, to kind of take a step back once you're done and really think about what you've learned that's new and, and how your results really correspond to the existing literature. 
Um, so we wanted to ask the question, how well do our results align with existing um, cognitive models of face perception? So we grabbed a really well-known paper um, that you know is, is sort of the, the a very well-cited representation of the cognitive model of face perception, and we kind of dug into how that particular um, model was pitched, and we, we observed that our purple cluster corresponded really well. You know, you know we're referring to this as perception and recognition of faces, and in the Gabini and Haxby paper. Um, there was a core system that uh, emphasized visual appearance of faces and, and, and posited regions that corresponded very well to our purple cluster. There is also an extended system in this particular cognitive model that incorporates person knowledge, um, which uh, corresponded very well to our green, green cluster highlighting um, involvement of the default mode network as well as a little sub-module here that corresponded well to our red cluster of face naming and lexical retrieval. And then notably, one thing that was missing is, is that we did see that one of our clusters, um, you know, focused on the you know, convergence of the salience network and, and really involved this visual spatial attention component. And that was not really included in the Gabini and Haxby model. And so in conclusion here, we were, this was our first kind of go at this and I'll show you in some subsequent slides um, how we've continued to work on this. But, but this was sort of the first time that we had taken this particular meta-analytic approach and used it to confirm and extend a well-known cognitive model of face perception where we essentially confirmed um, with three of our clusters, uh, this existing model, and then it extended it using the additional salience component here, um, demonstrating that this large scale data mining approach can really inform the evolution of cognitive models by meta analytically probing the range of tasks that are included um, across the literature. And so then as I, as I sort of alluded to, We've used this model uh, a couple of times uh, since in, in different sorts of application scenarios. Uh, the first was on face perception. Um, and then in 2018, a grad student of mine, Katie Bottenhorn, uh, did the same type of approach using naturalistic tasks. Um, in 2018, uh, at the time a postdoc of mine, used this to examine emotional tasks. And then more recently, we've looked at reward tasks. This is another grad student in our lab, uh, Jessica Flannery. And then um, we collaborated with some folks over in Germany uh, really recently to look at emotion regulation. And so it's been a real fruitful line of work to kind of take this clustering approach and this large scale coordinate based um, data mining approach to really kind of dig into um, a, a, a particular construct and really synthesize results across the literature. And so I'll say at this point that um, I've been in this meta-analysis game, you know, since the very early 2000s and, and staring at these maps, um, you know, for 20 years really starts to, to reframe how you think about brain networks. Um, and so I've got here a, a, a quick little summary of all of these different maps. Um, that we've looked at really recently from this clustering based approach. And I gotta tell you that, that when you sort of take a step back and look at the results across constructs, one thing that we really noticed is that, yeah, across all of these studies, we see the salience network popping up. We see the default mode network popping up. We see the central executive or frontal parietal network, whatever you wanna call it, um, popping up a lot. And you know, this really aligns with um, you know, our now accepted model of psychopathology um, such that psychopathological processes especially associated with mood disorders are commonly associated with aberrant connectivity within and between salience network, default mode network and the central executive network. Um, and this was really laid out very nicely in a 2011 paper um, by Menon that, um, you know, frames this as the triple network model or the tripartite network model that, um, you know, does a really nice job describing how it, the, the dysfunctional connectivity in these networks can really lead to diminished cognitive ability 
um, and diminish control over self referential processes such as rumination. So this particular tripartite network model is, I think, um, really important for understanding the maladaptive network organization and function in psychiatric disorders. And it's certainly showing up in so many of our meta-analyses um, that are both associated with um, clinical populations as, as well as healthy individuals. These, these networks are just simply very, very important. Um, so, with that, I'm gonna do a little bit of a transition. And um, I, I kind of alluded to this just a second ago, speaking of these large scale networks, if you do spend any time reading through the neuroimaging literature, you'll nearly immediately see a variety of memes that all reference the canonical frontal parietal patterns. Um, you know, some people refer to it as the central executive network, the cognitive control network, the dorsal attention network. Um, there's a lot of different names that folks are using out there. And we were really curious to see if the current state of naming conventions for these commonly observed brain patterns is consistent or perhaps inconsistent throughout the literature. And if it is inconsistent, then we wanted to highlight that that's potentially a big problem because that's confusing, number one, to call different things the same name and the same things different names. Um, you know, this can limit our ability to coherently discuss and interpret our community's collective findings. So while most of this talk has focused on um, coordinate based meta analysis, this is an example of what's possible with an image based meta analysis. We thought that given we were given the fact that we were really concerned about the spatial specificity of the use of these different names that an image-based meta-analysis was the most appropriate course of action for us to kind of synthesize things across the literature and explore whether the labels that authors use when describing their network patterns, um, whether or not they consistently overlap with or are clearly separable from different topographical and brain networks. So that's my little intro there. Um, we searched PubMed for papers that reported spatial patterns um, with the corresponding functional labels that are listed here. And so that was a, a, a very intensive literature search. We focused on studies examining data from healthy participants between 18 and 70 years old that used whole brain analysis methods. We grabbed a couple of maps from uh, NeuroVault that, that folks had uploaded, but for the vast majority of the papers that we found, we had to email the corresponding author and, and ask for help in, in getting a hold of their maps. Um, this was a process that took many, many, many months and a lot of follow up. Um, I could write a paper itself just on how you know lots of folks didn't have access to the maps anymore. Um, lots of times we had to go on a real extensive Easter egg hunt with the authors. Um, it required a lot of follow up, and that's why I'm saying is it's you know image based meta analyses. I, frankly, they're preferred, but they are so much more work in, in getting the actual data that you need to meta analyze. Um, but in the end, we obtained 360 maps that were reported in an original set of 188 publications. Um, we took each of those maps, we re-sliced them, we re-normalized them to get them all to the same template, and then we performed a series of image-based meta-analyses. Um, and what we found was that Within a given label, so like for the group of studies that labeled their maps central executive network, no individual network label map exhibited a correlation of greater than 0 0.6 with its respective constituent maps, and that, that's the solid line there. So within a label, there wasn't a whole lot of consensus. Between the labels, so comparing, let's say, central executive network label and cognitive control label, the average, average maps for EN, FPN, CEN, and WMN, those all exhibited a correlation of greater than 0 0.8 with the average of all the maps. And then the average maps of the VAN, ECN, TPN, CCN, and DAN had a correlation of less than 0 0.6. And so what this means, kind of shorthand summary, is that multiple different labels are being used to, to describe topographically similar networks. Um, but with that, with, with these, uh, the 0 0.6 result, there is some evidence for some distinct networks for some of the other labels. 
but for so many of them, um, there wasn't much distinction. So then the question becomes, are these all actually the same networks? So for this one, we threw all of the maps into a clustering algorithm to look for clusters of similar patterns. Um, and what this re re revealed is that while the label use is inconsistent, hierarchical clustering of the images themselves revealed four distinct topographical clusters. Um, and so with that, I'm trying to see here. Yeah, with that, you know, the argument then is that we as a field need to do a better job in labeling our maps in a really consistent way. Um, so as, as part of this paper that, that's currently in review right now and available as a, as a preprint, we are sharing these patterns via neural vaults and we do provide labeling recommendations for future studies. Um, there is also right now an ongoing um, task force for the Organization for Human Brain Mapping that I'm, I'm contributing to. It's the OHBM Network Nomenclature Task Force. And that's a group of individuals who all have extensive experience in um, studying functional brain networks. And so we're trying to come up with a series of community recommendations for how folks can go about labeling their networks. Because as we saw in this particular image-based meta-analysis, there's not a lot of consistency. And, and my feeling really is strongly that if, if, if we're not doing a good job labeling things, then that's going to have downstream effects in how we discuss and interpret our findings. And so much of the work that's being done these days is about functional brain networks. So it's really important. Um, it's not just in interesting from an informatics perspective, but it's really important from a community coherence perspective that, that we're discussing things in a way that, that, that's really consistent. Okay, and that is actually the end of my talk. So I wanna thank everybody for their time. Um, I have an amazing group of folks that I work with in Miami. We have a lot of fun and um, we certainly don't get any snow in April. Um, so I do wanna thank everybody for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Angie, thank you so much for that, that great presentation. Um, as people are trying to think of questions, I wanna ask a couple. So one of the things that is great in my view about meta-analysis is not only can you look for, as you say, synthesis across uh, different um, studies to look for you know, common areas of activation. One of the things which is kind of cool about meta-analysis is also incorporating information about some of the study characteristics and actually learning a little bit about how the literature tells you, what the literature tells you about how these studies are done. Is that something which is um, kind of a focal point of many meta-analyses, or is that something that's uh, maybe not done in neuroimaging, but maybe more in other realms? You mean the different types of tasks? I'm thinking of like different, um, like, you know, proportions of males and females, I'm think uh, as a, a as an element of a study, um, country of origin, like where was the study done? Um, you know, magnetic field strength, uh, that kind of thing. Are, are, is there variance in reported results, which are based upon factors which are inherent in the study? So this leads me to my little, um, uh, you know, big community horn where I want to say it really comes down to our reporting standards. Uh -huh. One of the things that is enormously frustrating about meta-analysis is when you have this nice juicy stack of important publications that have been out there, the variability associated with what people actually report about is so high that it, it ends up becoming hugely frustrating. Um, I think that we do have the potential to really look at so many interesting aspects of variability. As you mentioned, when it comes to participants, yes, the sex gender issue, also race ethnicity. We are right. and, and, and continue to be a very predominantly weird um, uh, 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 field where so much of our studies are, are Western educated industrialized. Right. You know, I mean, uh, we don't have that um, high level of diversity and inclusivity in our studies. And, and, that, and the origins are that because so much of neuroimaging is hard that once you get to the point where you're recruiting participants, it's like, okay, how can I just get people into the scanner, right? <laughs> so focused on the technically challenging aspects of it. 
um, that we haven't done as good as a job in making sure that our studies are as diverse and inclusive as possible. Um, and I do think that analysis gives us an opportunity, at least algorithmically, in terms of you can do a meta regression where you associate um, you know, your, your activation pattern with some external variable associated with your study, whether it be your, your sex gender ratio or um, any other number of things that, that you pointed out. But finding whether or not a, a, a particular paper for all of them have all given you information about that thing, it, it doesn't happen. There's so many critical details that get left out of this paper or that paper. Um, and that's why I really like to also point out the COBITAS document that OHBM published several years ago that give a real clear guideline of when you are writing up your paper, please publish all of these things um, because it's really important for folks who go back to do data mining the literature to make sure that they have all the data that they need. And that's why I also like things like fMRI prep which these days they'll actually generate an automated bit of text that's output from the, from the analysis that goes directly into the manuscript. Um, and I know there's been a lot of pushback from manuscripts and, and from, from publishers about whether or not that's plagiarism or not. And, and that really gets a fire lit under me because I'm like, we need consistency we need clarity and communication and we need comprehensiveness of all of this information. So if there are ways that software can help us do that, you bet I think that's the right way to go. That's great. And you had mentioned um, uh, reproducibility um, and yeah, you've talked a, a, a lot about that. And I, I think it's so important to be able to have things like where you can look at a literature from a meta analytic point standpoint and be able to make a statement about what's reproducible. And I guess that gets me to things like statistical power calculations and getting an estimate of what is, you know, how often are we going to correctly reject the null hypothesis? Um, because so many studies in the neuroimaging literature, as you say, you've done all this stuff and then you're just grabbing people who get in the scanner and you may end up with a statistically significant result but you've got a sample size of 12, you know, right. and I'm, I'm curious if you have a comment about how meta-analysis might be able to help us to understand what some of the implications are for our statistical power and our reproducibility. I don't know if I have a comment about meta-analysis related to that. I, I do know that my experience with ABCD is really framing how I think about that in, in the sense of ABCD is the largest data set that I have worked with yet. I mean, it's close to 12,000 participants and um, the only you know really larger one that I'm aware of is UK Biobank. And you know a recent, I guess maybe a six month old preprint that's come out of Wash U's ABCD group is that you know the effect sizes for some of the brain behavioral analyses in ABCD are so small mm -hmm. um, that I really wonder about the plethora of, um, I'm sorry, of um, studies that are out there with are really small sample sizes. And I have been spending, you know, everybody's doing quarantine and pandemic uh, a little differently. And I've been spending quite a lot of time just simply thinking about the future of fMRI, that if, if we need these really large consortium-based studies to find meaningful effects, and, and that's the key word these days. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a really cool ABCD paper out there about meaningful effects. Um, but if, if we need these really large multi-site consortium what does that mean for a single lab? What does that mean for their future and, and the type of work that they're doing? So, I mean, that's I a really good point. You know, if you need these major multi-center collaboratives, everybody using the exact same scanner and exact same scanner protocols, and you're talking about sample sizes of, you know, tens of thousands tens of, of individuals thousands. Right. to find this microscopic effect size. Uh, yeah, that is uh, very telling. I mean, those are expensive studies. They cost yeah. millions of dollars and very often they're going on for a decade. That's a lot of money and uh, 
right. activities that get soaked into that that might not get down trickle down to the individual investigator wanting to do their particular cognitive activation task, right? Right, right. I mean, I uh, love the the small local lab. Like here in Miami, uh, we live in a predominantly Hispanic Latinx community. Mm -hmm. And so I personally am really enthusiastic about pursuing studies where we look at Hispanic health disparities. There's a dearth of literature in this area, and it's important to highlight, um, you know, different experiences across the U.S. So I'm, I'm really wanting to pursue that type of work. But I got to <laughs> tell you, I, I do take a step back and I try to think about how to align my interest in that area with my feelings about power and, um, and and the ability to generalize and replicate. And I don't have any solutions. I'm, it's definitely something that's on the 90 states, though. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question from one of our uh, participants. Um, do you have a favorite meta-analysis methodology? I do. Um, so I was involved in development of the ALE method um, from the very early days. I am partial to ALE, activation likelihood estimation. I spend most of, I mean, all of the actual meta-analyses that I've processed have been ALE meta-analyses. Um, there's also two different databases. There's the BrainMap database and the Neurosynth database. And I have been spending more of my time with the Neurosynth database lately because it is, it is larger than BrainMap. Um, and so one of the tricky bits is that if you use Neurosynth, you're sort of wed to the MKDA analysis method. Um, and if you use BrainMap, you're sort of wed to AIL. And, and that's why I like to pitch Nightmare because Nightmare kind of takes all of those different things and puts it in a central Python package. So now um, we get to do our preferred use case, which is to use AIL in conjunction with Neurosynth data. What's the future of, of brain map? I know that you've been sort of uh, disassociated with the day-to-day -day activities for a while now, but right. um, you must have a, a, a vision or thoughts about how uh, that is going to move forward because it's been around for a while. Um, it has it been a around future? for a while, right. And so um, for those of you who, who, who want the backstory, I was in San Antonio um, for a number of years and worked solely on the brain map database. But in 2012, um, I was recruited by FIU to, to develop their cognitive neuroscience program. And so at that point, I kind of stepped away from brain map a bit. Um, and I'm relatively agnostic at this point, you know, use whatever tool or resources is best for the current um, case. Um, in terms of the future of both brain map and, and neurosynth, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I, I definitely think they, you know, they each have their, they each have their strengths and that brain map is a manually annotated database. So they're actual research assistants on the other end who are coding papers and putting in the database and manually annotating the task and the behavioral domain and all the participant information. Whereas Neurosynth on the other hand, uses a web, web scraper um, a tool to kind of scrape all the coordinates from the, from the uh, HTML file and, and put it in there. And so as a result, there's you know, some errors associated with that. And also when a paper publishes a bunch of tables of coordinates, each representing a separate contrast, those all get lumped into one group. So mm -hmm. um, strengths and weaknesses with both. And um, I would hope that each would continue to go on and exist because they are both really useful tools for the community. And I don't know if you saw Jack, but Tal just recently announced on Twitter that he is leaving academia to go work for Twitter. Is that so? so? Wow, mm -hmm. that's a loss. Wow, interesting. It is, it is a huge loss. So um, my understanding is that he will pass his projects on, I think to Alejandra. Um, yeah. De La Vega, but um, you know, this is the nature of this, right? We, we have resources that are developed for the community and, and we like to think that they will exist um, forever. And sometimes there is an evolution and we move on to the next thing. So maybe there's a next thing. That, that, that's for sure. Uh, I can speak to that experience. One thing yeah. which is kind of interesting <laughs> is the, um, uh, very often in the community, and this is, you know, neuroimaging has had its share of these, but uh, other groups or other uh, domains of neuroscience have done this too, where they have these kind of grand challenges where, for example, there may be a 
common data set. And they would just had one of these, right? Where common data set is thrown up and uh, they say, okay, everybody, analyze it with your favorite an analytic method and then, but send your results back or, you know, share how you did it and share your workflow and basically say what you did and then look for commonality and consistency across different groups. So uh, using different methods and whatnot. I'm curious if perhaps there might be a meta analytic version of such a thing saying, Hey, everybody go and like, look at the literature on working memory for the past 30 years and do a meta-analysis of it using whatever your favorite meta-analysis is and basically putting AL analysis head to head with something else, you know, neurosynth or something and looking for consistency or commonalities. Has anybody ever given some thought to that? No, I don't think we have. And I love that idea. I Angie, this is it. We're, we're going to be famous. This is going to be awesome. I'm, I'm putting a link in the chat. <laughs> for those who aren't familiar with the NARPS paper, I'm, I'm linking you to the website there. This thing was amazing. That's yeah. Very similar thing, right? Here's this data set. There were 70 teams that came together and full disclosure, our, our site at FIU included one of those. Um, and just to see the different results that you get when you basically say, here's the data, but you go analyze it. They gave us like nine hypotheses to test, I think. Um, but full flexibility as to whatever analysis method we wanted to do. So I mean, if you're not familiar with NARPS, check it out. Yeah, this is I mean, a super the, important point. The, this is a, 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 it's been a very topical thing in uh, neuroimaging because uh, neuroimaging kind of gets a bad rap about, as we sort of discussed, its reproducibility. So this was an attempt to kind of like illustrate uh, reproducibility yeah. and just kind of the natural variation that exists between groups analyzing the same data set. I'm just kind of curious if there might be a meta-analytic version of this uh, as well that could I be a there should be. future thing. And, you know, you could tell people to, you know, stick to a particular flavor of cognitive domain, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, attention studies or visual studies or uh, I don't know, whatever, um, and get groups to kind of analyze those literatures and share their results. That would be kind of intriguing. Mm -hmm. like um, the um, One of the things which is kind of interesting and, and you didn't mention it, I guess I got to uh, ask about it is, you know, where you have the coordinate based systems, obviously that's something which is, and you, as you say, you can very quickly go through and look at those coordinates, create an AL analysis um, and get a sense of, of what's going on. Um, Neurosynth and being able to look at the actual maps is a little more challenging because you just have those, you have the maps, which is great, but maybe you're, you don't have all of them or I don't know, other reasons. What about the real data? What about the actual underlying fMRI time series and other things that go into it? And what are, what are some of the, yeah, because obviously going back to the raw data is kind of a vital, would be a vital step. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on it? I think you could speak to this a little bit more clearly than I could. I'm just um, your humble, I'm just your <laughs> humble host, Angie. You know, I'm spending more time thinking about that because again, of working with ABCD data. Um, just because we're an ABCD site at FIU, um, we're still held to the um, policies and procedures for downloading ABC data and analyzing it just like any other site. We're not allowed to use our own local site. We have to go through um, the NMH data archive. So, you know, we have been spending a good amount of time figuring out like that's, that's ABCD is secondary data analyses, right? They're data made available to the, to the whole community. Um, it's different in that it's all the same protocol when she start thinking about um, kind of trying to mine the literature, but doing it through raw data, um, then obviously you're, you're, you're really coming from a place where you're either considering um, the open neuro platform that Russ Poldrack has developed, which makes data sets available. Um, or, you know, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, the Enigma model is becoming so popular uh, across a variety of, of different contexts. Um, we, we've been spending a lot of time with the Enigma addiction group. Um, mm -hmm. And we are in the process right now of conducting some resting state analyses on data that was collected across a whole bunch of different sites. And there's not a whole lot of harmonization in the protocol. And when you think about the addiction perspective, 
um, you are talking about how use, uh, substance use is uh, quantified. And so trying to compare this set of cigarette smokers to this set of cigarette smokers to these alcohol users, mm -hmm. um, it becomes really, really important to really think about um, per participant use characterization. Um, so, you know, you're asking me to start with something really simple, coordinate-based meta-analysis, and then kind of go up a little to image-based analysis, and then go up a level to um, getting in the raw data. And, and with each level, you just get so progressively more complex. It gets more powerful, right? Because you always want the, the absolute rawest data that you can get. Um, and so, you know, the, the time for the project starts mattering, like you said, Having a having a undergraduate or grad student sit down and synthesize the literature and coordinate basement analysis, particularly if they're working either through BrainMap or Neurosynth, is a relatively easy project. We love giving those to students. It's a great way to get introduced to neuroimaging without all of the Absolutely. technical challenges that come along with that. You don't have to teach them how to pre-process. You don't have to teach them, um, you know, the uh, noise removal and spatial normalization. You can just have them start getting thinking about, you know, brain function location correspondences. So it, it really depends on what your goal is, right? As always. As always. Well, I think we've reached the top of our hour. Angie Laird, thank you so much for a, a great talk and a really wonderful discussion here at the end about all these different uh, uh, pluses and minuses of, of meta analytic data analytics and uh, uh, what the, in particular though, what the value is and how you can very quickly synthesize literature and get some understanding of what's going on. And uh, clearly that's been successful for you. And hopefully um, this will be something that others will uh, uh, take a dive into as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody who joined us and uh, everyone have a great weekend and uh, we'll see many of you next week. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Jay. Had a great time. Thank you.